Glenn told you I'm a, uh, an orthopedic spinal surgeon. I'm at the Houston Clinic in Columbus, Georgia. Um, and I've been there about 20 years. And, and spinal surgery has really evolved since I've been uh, uh, started practicing spinal surgery 15 to 20, uh, to 20 years ago. Where now um, we're doing more minimally invasive type surgeries uh, with, uh, you know, the benefits of that. And, um, um, but anyway, so I, I wanted to um, talk about uh, some of the new advances in minimally invasive spinal fusion. In addition to that, the most exciting thing is, um, is the uh, biologic approaches that uh, are coming in the future so we don't have to do these invasive procedures. So, um, obviously discogenic lower back pain is a significant cause of morbidity and it's multifactorial. Um, this is a, one, a patient of mine who was 25 years of age who had uh, three level uh, disc degeneration. But this is primarily, uh, it, his degeneration is most likely degenerative and is, is uh, genetic in nature but there's also a mechanical uh, factors uh, where uh, the annulus tears, but, and then aging, of course. Everybody uh, uh, gets these degenerative changes as they age. What happens is the disc loses its, um, ma the matrix, uh, the proteoglycan uh, content decreases and the uh, water content decreases and subsequently on MRI you see the drying out of the disc and the dark degenerative discs. Um, so hopefully we can avoid this type of surgery on that patient. This is a very, uh, he had the back pain for many years and uh, wanted something done so uh, in his case he had an inner body fusion at the L5-S1 level and two level uh, t disc replacement. But this is not going to last forever so hopefully with the biologic approaches, we can avoid this type of things. The other treatments um, for back pain, obviously uh, therapy, um, and then um, uh, fusion, either from anterior or posterior, and then there's uh, total disc replacement. So once again, um, this is very exciting in our field because back pain is so common. Um, to uh, actually regenerate these degenerative discs with the use of mesenchymal stem cells. So this is uh, one uh, paper that's, uh, there's a lot of uh, basic research being done now uh, with disc uh, uh, regeneration with, with the use of stem cell. This was in Journal of Spine in May 2012 where they used um, immunoselective mesenchymal precursor cells uh, in a sheep model. And um, they used an enzyme to initiate disc degeneration and then three months later injected uh, the discs with either the mesenchymal precursor cells in high, hyaluronic acid, high, hyaluronic acid alone, or, or saline. And the results were that it showed significant increase in the proteoglycan content with disc height index returning to normal, returning to baseline in all the uh, uh, treated cells. So they're doing a, uh, and this is a, 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 com a company from Australia that's uh, uh, doing clinical trials now and um, at six month follow-up uh, they're showing s uh, successful um, pain relief in 71 percent of the uh, uh, patients who had uh, mesenchymal uh, progenitor uh, or, or precursor cells in the high hyaluronic acid injected as opposed to the two control arms, which we're not doing as well. Okay, so now I'm going to, <laughs> as you know, uh, I don't have a lot of experience, uh, well, you may know, I, I don't have a lot of personal experience with the use of stem cells and treating degenerative disc disease. Like I said, I think what I was going to say about spinal surgery, we're always the last ones <laughs> to change. You know, the sports medicines guys were at the forefront of of uh, you know arthroscopy and all that stuff and, and spinal surgery is finally making that move. So we're into doing minimally invasive surgery and um, so uh, that's where my topic is. Um, there have been a couple of new advances that really have uh, 
springboarded uh, uh, minimally invasive spinal fusion, and uh, I, I um, and one of the uh, major uh, techniques that has evolved, uh, and this we, they started doing this in, in Brazil in 2005, this, which is a lateral trans-psoas approach uh, to the lumbar spine. So. Um, a uh, patient is in the lateral decubitus position and you basically go through with a blunt, uh, make a small incision over the lateral aspect of the disc and with a blunt trocar pass into the disc and then you dilate with dilators to, to form, uh, uh, to get a, to d develop a space down on the disc and then you apply a retractor. And it's under direct visualization but this can be done through a one inch incision lateral incision. It's applicable to the lumbar spine from L1 to L5. At L5 S1, the lowest level, the pelvis is in the way, so that, uh, it, to approach that anteriorly, you would have to still do an anterior retroperitoneal approach. But so this is one of the advances that has really helped us a lot. And the other advance is the uh, uh, placement of percutaneous pedicle screw instrumentation. So we don't have to make the big, I call fillet incision, you know, where you have to expose the entire spine to do lateral process fusions. So with, uh, with the, you know, with the use of percutaneous pedicle screw instrumentation, we, a lot of times we don't have to, um, uh, uh, you know, we don't have to make the big incision. And um, the other technique that I, I use uh, in order to avoid the big incision is a lot of my surgeries I'll do what's called a posterior, uh, posterior lumbar interbody fusion. I'll show examples of this later where we just make a small incision, uh, to, to an incision big enough to perform discectomy, but through that incision you can uh, remove the disc and place interbody spacers and then fuse in, in the disc space and then um, uh, place the uh, pedicle screw instrumentation. So it can all be, it can be done through a small, one single level fusion can be done through a one and one half inch longitudinal incision in the puncture wounds to place the pedicle screws. So obvious advantages of, a percuta of a minimally invasive spinal fusion is um, the most obvious to me and the most advantage, the biggest advantage is preservation of the, mu uh, the posterior musculature and it, it attachments. Those muscles are there for a, a, for a reason. So if you strip the spine of the muscle attachments, then the spine becomes weak, and then they will um, it, subsequently uh, uh, develop uh, adjacent segment problems and repeat surgeries and that type of thing. But anyway, um, uh, other advantages, uh, obvious lower infection rate because we don't develop the big space. Um, and then less blood loss, faster recovery. This is a case of mine where it's, um, this is a, a kind of a unique case. It's an, it's an isthmic spondylolisthesis. It's at the L3-4 level. Um, but anyway, he has a pars defects and the, the, the degeneration of the disc with the sl slippage. Now this, yeah, you can't, Treat this one biologically. This one needs surgery, I think, and it'll always need surgery. He also has a collapse on the left side where the, this nerve is getting um, compression. It's an, it would cause what's called an L3 radiculopathy. So pain in this thigh. Um, and he was treated um, through a one inch incision on the side with a, uh, this is actually an expandable uh, implant that's placed in from the lateral approach. And then this is a, a these are just pedicles, polyaxial pedicle screws and a rod. But this, this, is, this shows his solid fusion and um, with an indirect decompression of the nerve root. So, he, so I don't know any other way you can fix that better. The ch ch classic surgery for that is a posterior uh, surgery uh, with a posterior lateral fusion with, with instrumentation. And um, doing that, you just disturb the uh, facet joints at the level above, you disturb the muscles in the back, you weaken the back, but um, this is, uh, and he, it, pretty much normal uh, back after that surgery. Um, so, uh, and then once you get good at these techniques, then 
I mean, there is a learning curve, but the uh, much shorter operating uh, time because the less smaller incisions you don't have to close. Um, and then indications for minimally invasive spinal surgery or uh, degenerative uh, scoliosis, where um, uh, you uh, enter the, uh, where, you, where you can go in laterally through the direct lateral approach for, um, and uh, on the concave uh, side of the curves and, and uh, place uh, uh, wedge-shaped spacers to, to correct degenerative scoliosis. Jason segment degeneration and pseudarthrosis. This is a patient that was referred to me, um, but she uh, had multiple back surgeries uh, with, uh, and with retained pedicle screw instrumentation. So, um, so, but I, this, this x-ray here is an extension x-ray and a flexion x-ray, which demonstrates movement at that, this level here, four or five, despite the hardware. So this is grossly unstable. And then she also has a, a, a movement here. She had a prior fusion here. The hardware was removed. So she needs one, two, three levels done. So this is a, uh, this is a heavy uh, lady who uh, is from South Georgia. So <laughs> she's about five foot tall and weighs about 250 pounds. But anyway, so it, the new techniques make this case, which would be very difficult, very simple. So. You go in, so I chose to treat her with a lateral, uh, through a lateral approach and place spacers here, 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 and then obviously I had to remove the hardware through an incision here, but then place the screws to fixate the upper portion through with a percutaneous technique. So then, so there, there she is. So that's, that's a nice case there where it's just spacers and I've restored her normal uh, uh, lumbar uh, lordosis. But other indications, as I showed the other, uh, that other case, uh, uh, degenerative or ismic spondylolisthesis in degenerative disc disease. And then disguidus is also, if they cut, if, uh, is, it's a nice approach to uh, 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 debride or fuse a spine for a, a case of uh, lumbar disguidus. Um, so, so, so the minimally invasive techniques have really helped us a lot. And uh, here's, I just have a couple other cases uh, that are kind of, that are interesting to me. I don't know, <laughs> hopefully they're interesting to y'all, but um, they're unique um, in that uh, 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 I've used uh, I, uh, different uh, t techniques that best treat this specific, you know, her, their specific problems. But anyway, the first patient's a 54-year-old female who had fusion. She's one of my patients. 12 years ago, she had a, a lumbar fusion, but, and she developed the classic problem of adjacent segment degeneration. So, so here, uh, this is uh, uh, old fusion, and she had an anterior posterior fusion, but now she's developed a degenerative scoliosis, and she has this flat back. So here's the extension x-ray that shows uh, these vacuum discs. So she has degeneration of these three, and, um, and still a great deal of movement there. So, so here's a CT scan, same thing, degeneration of the disc, and she does also have significant spinal stenosis. Here's a preoperative CT that shows the spinal stenosis. And then, so I elected to treat her, instead of taking out this hardware, um, I used uh, the lateral inner body devices through the lateral incision, but then through, through three separate incisions, you know, an incision here, incision here, incision here, and then this rod, the fixation device was passed um, percutaneously. So I didn't have to take out the hardware, and I can tell you this lady's a year, two years out, and she's done really well. And the indirect decompression, so I didn't even decompress the spinal canal. So if you, the alternative operation for her would be to take out this hardware and do her from the back and then you risk the non-union, you know, you name it. But this is done uh, with minimal blood loss and, um, but, uh, and it worked out real well for her. Um, this is her six month follow up, no change. And then uh, here's an interesting case. Um, this is more uh, traditional 
uh, type of uh, surgery that we do, degenerative spondylolisthesis. This is a 35-year-old male, he, he, uh, several month history of increasing back pain, left thigh pain and paresthesias. But he, he, had a, he had more, this is a developmental type condition he had, he had a slippage here, but he had developed stenosis and narrowing. And then this is flexion, extension, flexion view and extension view. When, and now I'm just, okay, then he's spinal stenosis with the single level disc degeneration. And now I'm just showing on, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> this is, uh, these are expandable uh, spacers and then the um, screws, but you can see the nice restoration and he, he did really well. And I got one more case. This is a 14 year old, uh, he actually is, plays American football. Um, but he came in and um, he had a, and this is an unusual case, he had a severe uh, L5 radiculopathy and the MRI shows uh, uh, neuroforaminal stenosis. He has a uh, dysplastic um, uh, spondylolisthesis, so he's got like a, a grade three. Now the classic uh, treatment for this in, in the literature is to go from L4 to S, S1 and do a two level fusion. And so he was going to go to another facility and they, that's what they had planned to do to him. But, and here's the uh, flexion, but he's got a very mobile disc. So I said, and this is tough because now here's his, here's his uh, il, uh, pubis, right? So can I go in the anterior? Not, fortunately, he's a nice thin male. So I thought I could get in there. And then he has this rounded almost pseudo joint here. So that's going to make it difficult. But I decided to do the single level and then do the front, do an anterior approach. This is his uh, MRI, so he actually reduces nicely for the MRI scan, it's not that bad, but he does have disc degeneration. So here, now he was front and back, so then I use a spacer with this little, this is a French device, the Roy, that's a peak implant with the, the keel, and then the screws are in percutaneously. So he healed, and I took out his hardware, and he played football. <laughs> Again, so thank you very much.